Okay, well, I hope everybody is staying dry today and is having a chance to, you know, cozy up and get ready for some ghost stories, some uh, local stories, and then maybe at the end we'll have a chance to kind of share some experiences that we've had around the area. Um, so my name is Willard Watson. I'm the Programs and Outreach Director here at the Blowing Rock Art and History Museum. And uh, it's just wonderful to see some of your faces in the, the Zoom chat. And I hope we can have a, a fun conversation this morning. So we've, we're really fortunate to have uh, Trent Margriff, uh, who's a lecturer at Appalachian State University. And he's about to provide us a presentation on the phenomenon generally described as ghosts, the supernatural, and more simply, the unexplained. Trent has worked in the historic preservation field for over a decade, and he has been through roughly 400 abandoned buildings thus far in his career. And he's also worked extensively in the collections of the Blowing Rock Historical Society in recent years and can provide some insights on local legends. Uh, Trent will put the content of the current Haints and Haunts exhibit at Brom into a larger historic, national, and regional context through additional images and open discussion of the audience. And Pro Professor Margriff holds a master's degree in historic preservation and currently teaches courses on architecture, extraterrestrials, and time travel. So really grateful to have Trent here. Uh, he one thing that I mentioned in the intro is that we have a Hanks and Haunts exhibit up at Brom right now. So Trent was instrumental in getting us set up for a Blowing Rock history exhibit. So if you come to Brom on our second floor, we have a, an exhibit about the village of Blowing Rock that is a permanent exhibit that's always going to be up in the museum. And there's a section on it about Hanks and Haunts and local ghost stories. And so we're going to dive into that today. If anybody has any questions, please just put them in the chat and there will be time for us to get to those um, later in the talk. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and let Trent take it away. All right. Thank you, Willard. And here we go. All right. Before I do my share screen too, I'm going to show a, a few visuals here. And again, Willard is right. This is pretty similar to something I presented two years ago. Um, try as I might, I still take sort of a national approach here. There is some blowing rock content and local. However, I will be honest in saying, given my background, it also involves some other places here in the country. So just be aware of that. And as I'm doing this, you can see my two daughters' drawings on the wall behind me. Um, I'm just going to flip the screen so you can see. I did put up a pile of blocks there. And the only reason why I'm doing that is because this house is notorious for when you have cat sitters and babysitters. For babysitters to say, well, I put your daughters to sleep. Everything was fine. However, who in the world built that building out of blocks in your living room? And we don't know. So if should this happen during the talk, this will be interesting to me because it's sitting right in front of me. So hopefully we'll see <laughs> what happens there. All right. Um, I, I was thinking my most blowing rock shirt I have, and I just have my park, when I worked for the parkway there, the core, that's the best thing I could find. Anyway, um, where did some of this information come from? Well, one is Blowing Rock Revisited, uh, the book I was fortunate enough to uh, have published five years ago. All sales go to the Blowing Rock Historical Society. Um, it's still around, and some of the content came from that. I finally did read Unquiet Grave about the West Virginia Greenbrier ghost as work of fiction. Um, some of the recent content is experienced or influenced by this book, Whisperers, uh, about the spiritualism movement in this country. And then one I really recommend that came out four years ago was Ghostland, um, History of America Through Haunted Places. And again, that one, this last one is the more academic researcher content there. Um, so I thought I'd put those plugs in. I'll let you know if the blocks start moving. Otherwise, go to share screen here. So um, <clears throat> again, I, I uh, scanned about 10,000 photos for the society, primarily in the summers of 2014, 15, and, and 16. And um, this is my own 
uh, daughter um, participating in the trick-or-treat at the downtown business owners in Blowing Rock two years ago. And I was looking for historical context for that, and you can see some of these images are from past children in Blowing Rock, maybe now older, maybe even on this call. If you know you are in one of these photos, let me know. Um, but also the outlet mall was pretty heavy on promoting Halloween once it opened, and so there was a lot of images based on that as well, too. So I put that out there sort of for context and why we do things like this at this time of year. Um, I know it's blurry, but I'm just going to paraphrase Will Rogers here. Um, like most historians, I try to find some example of sources, whether it's newspaper images, previous written record, actual artifacts, things like that, etc. And um, I did do searches for various terms through the Watauga Democrat and the Blowing Rocket. And if you're wondering why I searched green, we'll get to that uh, in a later part in the slide too. But I do just want to point out, here we have um, elementary school, Mrs. Winkler's sixth grade class having a Halloween party here at school. And then Ruby Winkler entertains Halloween party locally as well. I cannot remember the year on this. I want to say, I think it was 1938, but there were candles, jack-o'-lantern decorations. There were talked about ghosts at the party. They serve delicious refreshments, including wieners, donuts, popcorn, candy nuts, and cider. So there's a larger, I guess, history here, if people are not aware of sort of using this holiday for festive events. Here's one example uh, in Blowing Rock at somebody's home there as well. Um, and again, as Willard mentioned here, let me get that up there. There we go. Um, I try to incorporate some of these panels a little better uh, this time around too, but I would encourage you to go see them at Brahm itself because some of the photos that went with them are also um, pretty strong. So right off the bat, um, most of these locations I was getting were talking with people locally. Um, when I was trying to prepare this talk uh, two years ago, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those there. Um, but I also also want to point out our our you know our definition of ghost may carry a wide net here. And so when that 150 year old maple uh, was a casualty of the storm there in front of St. Mary's, I mean that really struck me as I looked out the window as well that you know, something was there for a long time and is no longer there and it's now gone. So a literal uh, ghost on the landscape, if you will. Brown Mountain, uh, Dr. Dan Caton has given a talk through Brown before about his observations of this, the campus astronomer here at ASU. Um, going way back though, even to the 13th century and of course Dan's proof, which changed him from a skeptic to a believer, occurred on Valentine's Day, uh, also, I think, 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So that was a pretty interesting turn of events for him. But notice this phenomenon, however you wish to call it, has quite a history of itself, even being noted in the state's WPA guide, among other sources. Um, and then this panel was more just to, again, evoke some of the larger uh, legends. You can place some of the ones locally and across this country having origins in Victorian uh, England. Uh, prior to that, though, two uh, Cherokee legends, Native American legends in general. Um, so usually there is some sort of larger context where, where local stories would be coming from as well, too. And I would be remiss if I did not note that I can't give you a time when this started. Maybe it never stopped. But the current trend for at least the past two decades of having intense profit on involving ghosts, ghost hunting, paranormal investigation, et cetera, clearly is sort of the reality we're in in 2020 and the impact there. All right. So I came across uh, these little free libraries are amazing up here. Um, I've found books as old as uh, 1740s in these little free libraries, so I don't know why people are getting rid of this stuff, but anyway, Blue Ridge Billy, a classic children's work that's set in Ashe County. I hand-delivered that to the Ashe County Library. They were overjoyed since all three of their copies had been stolen up to this point. 
And again, it's a kid's book, uh, but in the back of the book, it has a definition. And there we have haunt or haint and ghost. And so it evokes that in that kid's book there as well, too. Um, some of the quotes, the main work of haunting is largely done by the living. Uh, all argument is against it, but all belief is for it. I, I threw this one in, welcome to the machine. Uh, Stephen King's is interesting. We always assumed aliens would at least have to be alive to invade, if you're familiar with his book, The Tommy Knockers. Um, and then Shirley Jackson, Haunting of Hill House. And I throw these in here to begin with to suggest I'm not trying to have a do ghosts exist or not. I, I think what is far more interesting is how humans um, interpret what they experience in that regard. And I think most of those quotes sort of get me there as well. Why me? As <laughs> ASU assures me that teaching classic works like War of the Worlds and Time Machine by H.G. Wells is far more academic than architecture and my background in historic preservation. Um, culminating in working for the National Trust uh, eventually. So I go with that. Um, they, they, make, they gave me an award for this, so I can't take it back now. So again, alien time travel. Uh, the Frisbee Golf sort of club you see there in the upper corner, the campus group has taken on a moniker of an alien and UFO logo, logo a long time ago. We can find images all the way back to the 1980s, which is interesting. But primarily here in the lower uh, corner, this image, these were my students helping the June Alaska community 10 years ago um, go over some of the housing and documentation of the housing that was there, et cetera. So that's, that's my background here involved in local history and for a string of events specifically got involved uh, in Blowing Rock local history through the Historical Society. I do want to bring up campus briefly. I did cemetery tours uh, yesterday, again, with some of my freshman classes. Um, and again, there, there, was a, there was a student, a past student named Hunter, Hunter Koch, who did ghosts on landscape at ASU, did a pretty good job there. Of course, Justice is now demolished after four months. It's gone. Those not aware had the same floor pattern as East Hall, which still stands, although perhaps not for long, as this is meant to be the new grand entrance to the university if you look at the master plan. Whether that happens or not, we'll see. I would also be uh, remiss not to acknowledge um, the recent passing of Michael Renegar, who um, has a East Hall memory website, uh, was a head of the App State Paranormal Organization, was pretty good resource for things related to app um, there as well. You can still see quite a bit of his work and research on some of the stuff he've done, he's done, uh, including Winston-Salem area and other places as well. Um, how, however, so touring the seminary, um, Circus Girl leaves, leaves Girl on Boone Cemetery. And again, this perhaps is the most famous one. This, this marker itself does not look like this anymore. It's been lying on the ground for the past 30 years. But again, traveling circus through Boone, she catches pneumonia. There's a big debate on whether she should be buried in the cemetery or not. Would she Christian as a circus performer um, worthy of that, et cetera. So I, I think that's, I, I use this as an example of when we talk about ghosts, we're sort of talking about this larger perspective where we judge the living while they've, they've passed. And we try to have these connections with this as well too. The trivet marker, again, this phrase, death is eternal life, why should we weep? St students really don't believe me that sort of the change in American culture on death as bad, et cetera, in past 150 years is somewhat new. Again, look at your original giant cemeteries in large cities and they were public parks. I mean, they were places of recreation, enjoyment, et cetera, celebration. They were not these places sort of of death. And sorry to ruin it for you, and I don't know if this gets me in trouble. I didn't think about that. Hmm. Oh, well, it happened six years ago. Um, the show Ghost Adventures interviewed me at the, um, the uh, former uh, Banner Elk Hospital there. And I guess I just want to put this out in the public that this is the context they gave me ahead of time to interview. So they plugged me with questions. I don't think this is a secret. Again, if you guys, if, if people think this is real, 
I have, I guess I have some news for you. I mean, they told me where they would be making sounds as we went through the hospital, where we'd hear noise, drip, water, at what time, et cetera. And of course they didn't use my footage because I didn't give them the answers um, they wanted. Um, they did do Sheriff Lance's footage and most, most importantly his wife who used to work at the hospital and she, she spoke of how this religious kind of take for her as well too. And again, Ghost Adventures never took this on, um, but I'll share this one quick. <laughs> Ghost Asylum did, and if you're interested in this episode, it has a pretty good rating. I mean, it, 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 it does go through the normal sort of trends, I would say, um, with what we call these ghost shows. Um, but there is one there uh, locally if you've never uh, viewed it. And again, why they <laughs> rejected me. Her email was scary. I said, I was waiting for my daughter's nap to end. She misspoke. If you'd like to arrive earlier, die to your daughter's nap. <laughs> that creeped me out as well, too. I put Detroit versus Blue Ridge Parkway in here because, again, as Willard noted, all these houses I've been in, my first job out of grad school was going through inner city Detroit, and we had to document buildings that were within 300 feet of a school, an active school, that were abandoned because they were to be demolished because they were havens for criminal activity, et cetera. Well, oddly enough, when I documented old Virginia farmhouses for the Blue Ridge Parkway, I ran through some of the same issues on these places. Squatters, people uh, living illegally, uh, a drug use. Wild dogs was by far the bigger threat to me. Wild dogs, wandering cattle on the parkway too. Um, than guns or people shooting or things like that. So some similarities there. But more importantly, once I got on the inside of both of these type buildings, it didn't matter if it was rural Virginia or any city of Detroit, some of the same exact experiences that I had a hard time sort of explaining uh, rationally. All right. Um, it was funny when we were at the hospital there and they were filming, I said, you know, you could just go across the road and go to the Banner Museum and talk to them a bit, et cetera, or the Lees McRae College and talk to some of them about their ghost stories, et cetera. They, they weren't exceedingly interested in doing that. And I throw in sort of the Civil War here as well. And, and I think you can see some of these titles here across the country, but we, th we throw uh, connections to events um, pretty strongly and to tell, in a way, real history as well. Here, here is the text of the marker there at the Banner Museum, which nicely um, through NC Digital, you can listen to these actually now. So if you can bear with me, just hear some of this history. I think it's interesting. Elk River. During the last years of the Civil War, an organized system of safe houses was operated here for escaped Union prisoners of war and refugees from Confederate conscription. Local residents guided them through blowing rock Father Mountain and into Banner Elk, where other guides led them on to safety in Kentucky and Tennessee. Daniel Ellis, Harrison Church, and Lewis Banner were among the guides, as were Keith and Melinda Boylock. Lewis B. Banner, a slave owner, was a unionist with three sons in the Federal Army. He frequently provided food and shelter for escapees while they waited for their guides. Banner's son, Samuel H. Banner, a member of the 5th Ohio Infantry, built this house after his discharge in February 1864. The Laurel Thicket by the river was known as the Land of Goshen and served as a hiding place for escapees and draft evaders. In January 1865, a raid on the Confederate Home Guard camp along Cove Creek in Sugar Grove originated in Banner Elk. After capturing Company B, 11th Battalion, North Carolina Home Guard, the Union Raiders returned to Banner Elk with a dozen prisoners. They spent the night nearby before sending the prisoners across the lines into Tennessee. Okay, and the thickets they mentioned there near the house museum and Banner Elk have been talked about hauntings, the house itself. Camp Mass near where I live out here as well. People have said they've seen things as well too. So this is all wrapped up in one singular Civil War event. But more importantly, look at how complicated this is. Union, the Blaylocks, if you know that story, is exceedingly complex as well too. 
And I sort of use this with my own students who think there's a simple narrative on the Civil War. If you were in the South, you fought for the Confederacy, North Union, et cetera. Um, but I think it's good to talk on the ghost stories with this as well. Stoneman's Raid um, has some of those. There is a signed letter in the Blowing Rock Historical Society from one local family in Blowing Rock who said legally they will never speak of what they witnessed regarding Stoneman Raid's ghost. Now, why they put that in a letter, I don't know, but because it's legal, I can't share with you much more beyond that. And if you try to access the file, you hit a roadblock as well too. The names are pretty much gone. So there's a local mystery for you. All right, um, having worked in the field of historic preservation for 10 years, Director of Preservation Oklahoma, Preservation Delaware, and the field office in Wisconsin for the National Trust, I, I, read, I witnessed a pretty sharp turn here on how we view um, when we have, say, supernatural occurrences in buildings. Yes, it is true. The minute you have a bunch of trespassers, you start posting YouTube videos, et cetera, you do run the risk of demolishing these stru structures as a quicker rate, but you also have the possibility of saving them. This is the orphanage in Marquette, Michigan, where I'm from, Marquette County, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which sat vacant for 45 years and is now uh, low income and senior housing. There's the rehab and it took to be honest with you, a video posted on YouTube about the ghosts there to get the investor from Arizona interested, and that's how it was ultimately saved. So there are these success stories as well, too. All right, speaking of where I'm from, and I think this is somewhat important, um, there was an odd proclamation by the White House on October 11th to recognize Leif Erikson Day, which mentioned the Nordic Americans, specifically the Finns in the Upper Peninsula where I'm from, and these are people on Facebook who I were friends with in high school who you'll notice are technically not strongly as Nordic. I'm not giving names and backstories here. Uh, one, of, one of these people was drafted by the San Jose Sharks to play professional hockey. One is a pediatrician and one works with autism services and is also a paranormal investigator on the weekend. You guess who is who. But I will say when I was in second or third grade and I was at the house of one of these individuals growing up, I remember very vividly going up the stairs to use the bathroom, the door was locked, went back up, then it was open again with the candle. And then uh, when I went back again, it was locked again. And I kept asking what's happening. And one of the people here on the screen said, oh, that's just, that's just my grandmother playing games with you. Well, I, I went home, I talked to my parents about that, and I said, oh yeah, well, that the grandmother has been dead for eight years. So there is a wide belief, again, that the deceased lived in that house, and this group was not alone. Um, if you've ever had an international student in your class at ASU, from any other country virtually except America, the idea of ghosts or the dead being present among you is really a non-issue. They almost find it laughable how our country takes this as some sort of big deal and something that's sort of different, where to most other cultures, it simply is not. Um, so again, somewhat as background there. Um, when I've gone through homes, you can still find Bible verses in the walls of some certainly New England homes, but also some of those rural Virginia ones had as well too. Um, think about how we exhibited the dead in homes in this country, the parlor, uh, versus the living room, if you've never made those connections before. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's probably not lost in translation there with the term ghost as well. And again, think about we used to celebrate this stuff closer to Christmas, not Halloween. Things like uh, Dickens' A Christmas Carol, which has not only things like time travel in it, but also ghosts, obviously, and sort of a background there. Now, I bring up some other definitions of haint because it is a demeaning term for a woman as well too. So you can perhaps see how there are some connections with some of the ghost stories um, we use with that. And I point on West Virginia here just a little bit. I, I mean, I like Mothman, I've had my statue or picture taken near a statue there. Does it go all the way back to the Battle of Point Pleasant? I can't answer those questions, but it's certainly a phenomenon and a business maker now. Uh, but West Virginia remains the only state and the marker got cut off. Only known case in which testimony, testimony from a ghost was used to convict a murderer. 
And again, you can read Sharon McCrum's take on that as well, but it is true, the historic marker is largely true on this as well too. Prior to that, this idea of the wizard clip and the voice happening in Middle Way, Virginia in the 1790s, not unique to that area. We can find lots of examples of early settlers who say they heard something. Maybe it wasn't God, maybe it was, but to do something drastic, to do something different, et cetera, and this phenomenon has a marker as well too. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up some of this other stuff again. I, in my family, my uncle, five, five generations of Methodist ministers, and I remember having detailed conversations with John Wesley on what he believed, on what they felt, et cetera. And again, he, he was certainly a believer in ghosts and things like that to the point where he was mocked or made fun of to some degree. Um, look at King James and the ghosts that came to him, the historical King, King James as well. Um, it'd be hard to argue with there aren't things in the Bible that would be considered supernatural um, as well. You can see Wesley's quote on this. Here's, here's what's also exceedingly interesting, and I updated this. Um, during quarantine here in 2020, um, exorcisms are a big business again. Why? Because people are spending more time in their homes feeling there is more possessions, more ghosts, et cetera. I mean, I guess this is logical here, but you can find this pretty strongly online, almost being compared to 1950s UFO sightings in the Cold War. And a lot of this is coming from a religious background and belief. All right, some of the ghosts on the landscape. I grew up with old mining towns and towers. This is a mining head frame in Ishpeming, Michigan. This is Fayette. Fayette, Michigan, which is known as a ghost town, quote unquote, existed for 26 years in the late 1800s as an iron smelting town, virtually intact. When I worked there as a student for two weeks in the summer, doing various rehab on the windows, et cetera, things like that, it was almost laughable to the state employees when I said, um, why are we feeling hot and cold in here? I mean, I said, it's like, it's changing very rapidly. And they just said, oh, if that's all old uh, Bessie's doing to you, then you, you better be lucky because some of us have a lot more stronger experiences working here 30 years or so. So it was eye-opening again how other people who had taken on this topic, Fayette, uh, makes its uh, marketing entirely as a ghost town there. All right, Oklahoma background there begins and ends with what we call the Skirvin Hotel. They're abandoned for 30 30 some years, it was on our most endangered list. We could not find a new owner. There was a piece that aired on the local news one night on Effie. Effie was the mistress of an Oklahoma businessman who she would meet in the Skirvin Hotel uh, to have their illicit affairs, et cetera. Effie couldn't handle not sharing the truth, committed suicide, jumping off one of the towers here. Now this you can show through newspaper accounts, et cetera. So, when ultimately this historic building is rehabbed as it was and is now used for visiting NBA players, certain players like Mr. Irving here, Duke alumni, are making a whole movie about this because of the ghosts he says he has experienced. Um, people have said the Oklahoma City Thunder have an advantage because visiting teams have to stay in this hotel because of the larger hot, uh, rooms to accommodate basketball players and beds and it's walking distance to the arena to the point where they are basically messing with the players, believe it or not, but there's something there as well. Be remiss if I did not mention working with Native American groups in Oklahoma, Saline Courthouse was probably one of my strongest experiences where you just sit there, you know this site was used for hanging of people who are not criminals, uh, when you talk about the hanging judge, which is in the frontier, here's where things like that happened. And you just get a chill. You get a sense of, yes, there's history here, but there's also something else. Thankfully rehabbed by the Cherokee Nation. Wheelock Academy of the Choctaw Nation used 160 years to Americanize or Christianize uh, Choctaw women. Um, the suggestion when I took the tour there that they're might not be hauntings here was just laughable to the members in the Choctaw party where they indicated, well, I mean, we know who they are. We know who they are by name. So that's largely why we're interested in the preservation of that building as well too. All right, but back to Skirvin. There's the video on the ghost piece on a local news station. And I cannot prove this, but I know one person did see that 
and the Skirvin Hotel is now part of the Hilton Hotel chain. Believe it or not, Socialite Paris Hilton was filming a show called The Simple Life in Rural Arkansas. They were in Oklahoma City that evening. I find it, I guess I'm being stereotypical here, but that she actually watched local news is a bit of a stretch for me. But all I know is three days later, I get a call in my office at Preservation, Oklahoma from the Hilton Hotel chain. How much is that rehab? Oh, I don't know, 40 to 60 million. And done. It's done today. So again, sometimes those connections have these sorts of things and successes. Gibraltar, uh, my personal sort of, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, this is the site I worked. Former DuPont Estate, 1845 building. Uh, so many people wanted to go through there with paranormal investigating, et cetera. Um, it was a historic garden, first female landscape architect. We went with that. We never did get to this rehab. You see they added on, et cetera, to the original building. The garage apartment was where my office was in. Um, yeah, thing had here. The, the best, I think, example was when there was lights on in the house one night and the neighbor said, you got to stop that from happening again. And said, you're going to get a fire. It's an electrical issue. Well, a fire marshal assured me there was no power to that building for the past 30 years. So when lights would come on at night, I'd even get local law enforcement to come say, hey, there's people up there, et cetera. They'd tour. There's no one up there. And yet the lights would be on in the upper floor. So that's one story. I could talk to you about things I saw levitating inside couches and stuff. But I can't keep it there. All right. <clears throat> Other ones, personally experienced. Again, I worked in Wisconsin. This book is pretty interesting, talking about this isn't ghosts, this is a bunch of cultures trying to get together and survive, which is an interesting premise. But room 711, I stayed with my boss in Nashville at a conference, the former hotel station. You can see some of the story there, Abigail waving goodbye to her soldier who never came back, was lost in World War II. So she still haunts room 711 to the point where people take pictures. I don't see anything in there, but this person does. And you pay more money to stay in this room, whereas I had the experience for free 12 years ago when we were there. All right, getting closer to home with Blowing Rock here. And again, I, I, I share some of this larger context and stories because maybe there's similarities or not. Is not the whole story of the blow, Blowing Rock, local lore, legend, etc., um, come to life? Um, here is where you are supposed to see the footprints or handprints of Mary um, in the building that is now housed in Tom uh, Town Tavern there, um, where again, some of the staff there said they definitely could see them, can talk about what happens to them when they work late, how suddenly glasses break, et cetera, things like that. Really a gruesome story though, might, could to suggest that this child had their hands in the cement and was burned alive as a punishment lesson by their parents. And unfortunately, I do need to sort of back some of this stuff up and I will tell you if I found any proof or not. Green Park Inn was another one of these, honestly. And again, the ghost log they have there, they don't really encourage it, but they got national news uh, when the Washington Post article listed them as one of the top haunted here. And you can see some of the background on the story. Laura Green, daughter of a founder who killed herself in room 318 after her fiance left her at the altar. Woman must marry and marry well to conform to the society of the time. Such refusal at the last minute would be too much for her to bear. And so that is why she haunts the premises is there. And again, that is a traditional sort of tale on ghost legend and lore there with local twists. But here's the facts. It's pretty easy to search things like Suicide, Laurel, Laurel, Green, 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 in the papers. See what comes up. Cone Manor, here's some of the things they're suggesting happen there as well, too. It also is pretty easy to research Town Tavern. All you can really find is that giant water heater explosion that happened there in the past, which is well documented. Um, I would also argue that just going on some of these trails uh, in the area. When I talked to locals, they gave me Greystone, Springhaven, M seemed to be coming up frequently. Some of the Shatola stories as well, too. And again, there's a whole online world based on some of this stuff. Uh, so I, I do want to cautious, I don't want to offend anyone here if these are relatives, etc. I apologize. But again, when I did the research, 
What does come up is just how horrible some things were in the past as well. And again, there's a suicide there locally that made the paper from Blowing Rock. Green came up for one death here. It was an electrical worker, it was a male. Uh, another uh, green, this woman was killed by her husband by a shotgun, point blank to the face. So there's some violent stuff in the past. Um, however, no ghosts associated with this, I could not find the proof of the Green Park in Laura Green there. All right. <clears throat> um, again, those locals know of uh, what uh, Mr. Critcher found there, all the sort of new graves they discovered. And again, ground. Ground penetrating radar is interesting here um, to figure out more. We use this, of course, um, at the cemetery on campus as well with June Alaska to find some of the uh, African American graves, just how many as well. Think of this as a dying resource, though, too. Literally, again, if there's more cremation, cemeteries might be your endangered placers in, in the future. And also, how some people used to basically come here to socialize, et cetera, things like that. Now, I'm not promoting this group. I am going to bring up their website because I found this sort of fascinating and how long they've existed here. And it gets to the heart of sort of what I think is driving some of the local ghost um, industry. Again, this, again, not being comfortable with death. And again, Western culture seems to have this on their back burner of having an issue with this. So how funerals used to work, pretty interesting. Why are ghosts so white? If you're familiar with that folklorist, but look at who this group is. Funeral industry professionals, academics, and artists exploring ways to prepare a death phobic culture for their inevitable mortality. Um, and again, I would argue that that's producing some of the best sort of information and research currently on why we recognize spirits, ghosts, apparitions, paranormal, et cetera for both logical and illogical reasons as well too. Not everything needs an answer perhaps. Uh, Kona State, again, we are familiar with the um, grave robbing of the site that took place that made the newspapers in the 1920s. Um, this was rather eerie when I walked there, it was December 2017. Someone had written this in the snow in front of the marker and there was no other car there on the lot. There was no other one walking that I came across, et cetera. I do realize this was the name of a popular movie that occurred earlier that year, but still um, some things there. You can read about the dog Fluffy here on the panel as well too, which is interesting. And again, that's part of the exhibit in Braun. All right, this I didn't have in the previous presentation, but I'm almost convinced this is having a larger impact when we look at hauntings in the area in the 1890s, 1900s, 1920s. Spiritualism, the attempt to communicate with the dead, primarily in this country, 1840 to 1920, let's say. Um, how many people practiced? Eight to 12 million is our best guess. This includes things like seances, et cetera. This article is vintage saying, spiritualism caused the civil war because people were doing witchcraft, et cetera. And you'd find tracks like this. All these pictures are books that were in Elliot Dangerfield's library locally. Biographies on him, et cetera. It does not get into this too much, but I would maintain that these books were those of uh, basically people that would practice spiritualism into the 1920s as well. And Houdini is one of the people who sort of exposed a lot of this as frauds and not really occurring. They said they were dead, not really communicating with the dead. It didn't go away. I'd say it morphed into something new. This is a stretch for people, but as I teach modern science fiction, uh, Interstellar is nothing more than an elaborate ghost story, Contact by Carl Sagan as well. The Arrival, if you really look at it, and other Earthy sort of films are about family members communicating with dead family members. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot of other good stuff behind it, but it's not really gone past some of the tenets of spiritualism in the past, et cetera. It's just wrapping it over a more elaborate narrative. For the real stuff that scares my students, if you've read any of Annie Jacobson's books working with Department of Defense in the past 10 years on what military experiments have happened now that we're releasing some of this stuff, this almost won the, um, as you can see, uh, Pulitzer Prize. 
So that's some of the really good stuff out there if you're not familiar with that. Of the stuff here, don't keep in mind too, I use this on my downtown Boone walking tours. Just because electricity comes to Boone, just because you have a store on King Street where you can get lighting doesn't mean you're going to. I don't, I, I don't think people realize that when this stuff comes out, what Thomas Edison is doing, what Tesla is doing with radio is seen as literally devil's work, demonology. It's not something that humans are supposed to grasp. It's not in the Bible, for example. So just because it's a new um, sort of technology doesn't mean it's widely accepted. And I, I think this is sort of how we get wrapped up in ghosts being demons, being evil, being satanic, this sort of stuff as well, too, because some of this stuff is coming together all at the same time. All right. Think about the profit to be had here as well, too. I use Scooby-Doo because think of every episode, no matter what version of Scooby-Doo, comes to a rational answer. The ghost was an old guy trying to get money or something like that. Think about what Casper really is. I mean, it's a deceased child, and yet we've turned it into an entertainment industry. I'm not picking on Gettysburg. I know you can find many in the other places in the South across the country, ghost tours, but it's driving a lot of this industry currently to see things. I put the women's bathroom symbol there with a black cat because, again, there's pretty sort of sexist connotations with this as well too. Tales from the Haunted South would be one of the stronger academic works to look at some of this. Plantation tours, how that's changed as well. Um, in case you're not familiar with the Virginia mask law that comes up at this time of year, yes, it's to prevent meeting of past clan members, in case you're wondering why they had the law. But there's also a deeper history too here as we talk about people disguising themselves, scaring others, et cetera, things like that. All right, working to a close here. Um, th this is the current sort of belief cycle. Um, and I'm sharing this because I can't, I do not remember the member of the Blowing Rock Historical Society whose home I went through, but it was beyond a smart home. It knew where people were in the house. It knew what temperature you needed in each, each room. It shut the water off. And I like this quote, uh, that was in Real Life magazine here. Your house may be haunted or it may just be a new smart, smart, smart home. I mean, think about how we've programmed our homes to continue to live even if no one in them is anymore. And there's a great book from the 1950s by Ray Bradbury, There Will Come Soft Rains, where he talks about a family that is deceased after nuclear fallout, but yet the home keeps living. And the home is ready to still have water, have running fuel and electricity and things like that. And he wrote that way back then. But think of some of our own homes are perhaps haunted by technology. I don't want to get into it, but I don't know if anyone else has this problem. My cell phone takes pictures on its own. You can laugh at me at this, but here's the most recent one. It took a picture at 3.43 in the morning, October 2nd. I don't know how. It looks like it's the full moon, actually. I'm going to end with this one. My own house. And again, these blocks haven't moved yet, so nothing going on there. But uh, if you're familiar with the Haint Blue, and Sherwin-Williams made an industry on this for some time, we now have various modifications. And they changed the name, actually, to Porch Ceiling now um, because of some of the connection with the term Haint Blue relating back to the Gullah culture and technically enslaved persons prior to that, et cetera. So it had some, some negative monikers as well. And again, this is, this is more coastal south. This is not so much up here, but all I know is I had three or four electricians at my house in the past, I don't know, a few months, um, several years ago, none of them could fix my electrical issue. Lights come on, come off, no one's touching them, et cetera. And the one guy finally laid it straight. I'm not gonna give his name. He's still very active in the area. Sir, I noticed you pointed over the light blue color on your porch because I worked on this place when it had a previous owner. That's right, I did, I told him. Sir, you don't have an electrical issue with your house and I won't be able to fix it. Good day. And what he was referring to is again that the house I currently reside in has some sort of apparition or ghost controlling some of this stuff there. All right. 
Um, there was feedback at a previous Brahm exhibit there when we had on Blowing Rock, which I guess curated with my wife on. I realize not a lot of this didn't focus on some of the local ones here, but I'll open this up for comments, questions, and I guess I'll check chat box as well here too. Um, it was just one thing I'd like to share. It's interesting that you mentioned the danger fields. So there's actually stories about Marjorie Dangerfield being a spiritualist and being able to find things that were lost. So it's Elliot Dangerfield's daughter. And so there was a time something was lost and they had like a little seance and she was able to find it. Okay, wow. And I don't know if you are familiar with that collection of books that uh, Tom mm -hmm. Delaney donated. There's about 60 total, but the titles there are all pretty strong on the spiritualism side. So there's a question that came in. It said, I believe that seances uh, became popular after the 1918 to 23 flu. Do you see a resurgence in the oh. mystical? Yeah, see, that's, that's an important connection. That's a, yes, that's exactly true. They also equate it to the death of World War I soldiers, and that's why it took off in European countries much more than this one as well, too. Very and good. frankly, if you look at this country, after the Civil War, we have a rise in this also. And again, so if it's people trying to communicate with deceased loved ones, maybe ones that have gone, you know, too soon. I mean, you can look at that, certainly. What are we up to 200 and... 20,000 20, or 30,000 deaths in this country in just this past year, et cetera, from COVID. So, I mean, it's, it's highly likely. When I did the research, though, on this, it was more so people who were, um, when they were spending too much time in their own house, they felt. And so things were happening during the day at their home. They had no idea what was going on and trying to sort of rectify that. Um, so yeah, you can find some examples of people like hi hiring Catholic priests or getting people to get involved in this again. Um, so yeah, I would say seances could come back into that mix where it enters popular culture again. That's probably not unheard of. Um, and then just some local ghost research. You know, I'm a big podcaster and I was looking up podcasts to see if there's anything about the ghosts in the Blue Ridge or uh, ghosts around Blowing Rock and everything like that. And I only encountered one episode of a podcast talking about Cone Manor being haunted. And it was just a terrible episode. They had their like did not know who the cones were and what they were doing. And it was someone who was a App State alumni. Um, hmm. that now lives in Charlotte that was talking about how they used to go hike up there and at night as students to try and uh, try and find some things. And then I just heard about um, the Bell Witch in Tennessee, which is one of America's oldest hauntings. Yeah, and, I, and that and so that story has been played out in other locations as well, too. Some of the common alleys there. You know, with Cone, since he doesn't work for them anymore, I'm sure I can share this. Uh, when I had my contracts with Blue Ridge Parkway to document stuff, I worked with Stephen Kidd, who used to be in the Asheville office. He's now moved on to a Florida Park Service site. But he would, t he would tell me outright, he said, I don't, you know, I have to do some things in Cone Manor, he said, but I'm getting out of there before five. <laughs> And he had enough conversations with other Park Service staff where they would share things and basically say, like, you know, we're, we're just comfortable with it now. We sort of assume this is going to happen here. Again, some of the stuff like lights, flying things, you know, things they can't explain. But it wasn't, it wasn't a giant deal. I think when it's a problem is when new, out, new people or outsiders, sort of that experience happens. And of course, we know Cone Manor had ghost tours in the past. I mean, official ones through through Park Service, but also also through partnering nonprofit entities. So, again, not so much for the money part, but for the history part to learn sort of why there might be sort of troubled individuals here, et cetera. All right. I see the names of a lot of my students on here too, but that's that's good. Yeah. Well, this was great. Uh, really engaging and informative and perfect thing to get folks ready for Halloween this Saturday. So um, 
Thanks a lot, Trent. Appreciate your time today. And uh, just so everybody knows, we've got copies of uh, Blowing Rock Revisited at Brahms Gift Shop, and then also a, a ghost, a collection of ghost stories from Western North Carolina in our gift shop as well. So if folks want to come over and see the um, Blowing Rock exhibit and get our Haints and Haunts content there and then pick up a nice book. Uh, the weather outside is frightful, so it is the perfect time for the spooky season.